Hey, my weirdos. This week, we are chatting with the incredible Denise Shaw. Denise is a performance coach who uses neuroeconomics and psychology to help improve both the finance world and honestly, professional athletes. We deep dive with her into the psychology of decision making and all things that have to do honestly with the way we figure out business decisions. Um, I don't think I was prepared for some of the questions and answers, and I'm so excited for everyone to tune in to all the things Megan and I asked Denise. So let's jump in. team, we are here today with the incredible Denise Shaw. Denise, thank you so much for joining us today. We are so excited to chat with you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> uh, and obviously, we have Megan, my co-host, on here with us as well. Uh, Megan, why don't we kick things off? Awesome. Hi, Denise. Good morning. Hi, Megan. Hi, hi. Okay, so um, we're going to just jump right into the questions. So... In our mind, each woman that we interview is a heroine in their own regard. That's you. Um, so in your own words, what has been your heroine's journey thus far? Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> you know, it boils down to following what I really think. So, like, I was in college and I wanted to work for IBM, which at the time was like, you know, like this great creme de la creme job. And they first told me that um, we regret we cannot encourage you to pursue a career with IBM after I had like a college interview. And I was like, yeah, what? Like, and I remember ripping up the letter and deciding I was going to be a trial lawyer. And then like after, I don't know, a few weeks, a few months, I, don't know, I was like, wait a minute. They don't know what they're talking about. I can do this job just because I'm not coming out of the school with the background they typically look for, doesn't mean I can't do this job. I'm like, so I just have to persuade them. So it took me like two years. I mean, they did have a hiring freeze in the meantime. Um, but that was like, what do I really think about this situation? You know, and then I can, I can go instance by instance, like five years into it, I was like, wait a minute, I can't be 40 and selling computers. Like I won't care, I'll have to slit my wrist. And so I quit. <laughs> you know? um, and then same with graduate school, like, wait a minute, like, I want to study neuropsychoanalysis, which is what it's called now. It wasn't called, it was called biopsychology then. So, and even to this day, I, I oftentimes have to say, okay, like, what do you know? What is reality? Do you know whether people see it or not? So I come back to that, you know, which you, some people might call self-belief, but it, it's it becomes that, but there's this kind of analytical process of where am I? What do I want? Why do I want it? You know, maybe it seems impossible, but what would it take? So, I mean, I could, you know, I've had a lot of experiences at this point in life, so I could give you more examples, but I think you get the point. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I love hearing all of that. Was there, was there like a specific tipping point for you? Denise, that like triggered you to move into what you do now? And if so, what was it? I was asked to rewrite my master's thesis for a little journal of psychoanalysis. And I was like, well, that would be cool because at one point I wanted to be like a journalist. And so somebody would publish something by me and that would be cool. And so as I was researching it, it was originally written in 93, 94, 95. And then I, this was like 2003. Some scientists had showed you had to have emotion to make a decision, you know, and everything in Wall Street and trading was taking emotion out of it. And I was like, what? Like, if that's really true. So that turned into me writing a popular article through a crazy story. But, and then I thought, okay, that's it. Like I got to write this thing and, you know, I got to have a little journalism experience and then people start calling and that was a tipping point. Like people, the article was called, it was called Freud's Path to Profits in a magazine called Stocks, Futures and Options. 
and it came out in December of 2004. And like by January of 2005, I mean, we had five or eight people call. And I was wow. like, okay, this is something. And at first I was like, can I coach them? Oh my God, I don't know. Like, you know, when I was being mentored by psychoanalysts. And one, a funny thing, I'll just tell you, there's a funny thing. Some famous trader guy who I can't even remember at the time. I, I can't remember his name now, but at the time I was like, I can't believe this guy's calling me. And the psychoanalysts that I was being coached by have this, you know, really, you know, don't tell anything about yourself, kind of just let the... And so they said, okay, well, like, you know, don't give people your background and whatnot. And so this famous guy calls me and like, I don't want to give him my background because the psychoanalysts are telling me not to, which, which of course in a business context, he thought was crazy, which was crazy. <laughs> and I never heard from the famous guy again, I, who I can't even remember now, but that was like a funny early on business mistake. I'm so fascinated by that because it, it sounds like you actually humanized and like brought emotions into finance which is usually a very sterile environment, right? Like men try to sterilize this entire concept and say it's just mathematical and all of these things. And you actually dragged emotion into it. And you said there's actually something to this outside of the the very like basic premise of, you know, valuations and all all of the, I don't know, the, the essential nuance that we're taught in school. Right, that the... the the arithmetic and probabilistic analysis of it. What no one realizes um, is that you don't make a decision on that analysis. You make a decision on how you feel about that analysis. So, and like, if you don't have the feeling, you won't do anything. And that's what the research was showing way back, you know, 18 years ago or whatever it was now, that people who, who the, the part of their brain that's more involved in emotional processing, if it was damaged, they like it couldn't decide what shirt to wear or what day to go to the most simple things, what to, you know, what the day to make an appointment, because you don't have any sense of what's right or wrong. So you just can, you go back and forth between, well, there's these reasons and there's these reasons and there's these, these reasons. Um, and when I first said it, I mean, it's fairly common now, but when I first said it publicly, it was, jaw dropping to people. I mean, I gave a talk, I ended up being invited to give a talk at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. And it was to the floor traders. And I had two comments that happened afterwards. One floor trader said to me, I cannot believe you got 250 floor guys to sit still for an hour. <laughs> uh, other, I understand I got, that. I got a call from a professor at Northwestern saying, did you really just get up and tell 250 men they had to listen to their emotion? I was like, well, they do. <laughs> Yeah, I did. I and still think. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. The truth is, I wouldn't be here if it didn't resonate. What started happening is people, guys like that day, and, and basically every talk I've given since, have come up to me and said, I knew it. I didn't want to tell anybody, but I've been using my intuition and my feelings. And like, so really, I only gave voice to something that people kind of knew. I hear that. And to be honest, I still think it's kind of a novel idea for a lot of traders still, right? Because everyone still thinks that technical analysis is so prevalent and so important. But I mean, when I look at the market today, that's something I think about all the time. I'm like, so much of this is emotional drama going on inside of people's minds. But like all of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like all of it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's interesting hearing a little bit about like your heroine's journey and like looking back about like, how did I get here and what are the the pivotal moments? But what I heard you say is like, you kept asking yourself the same questions of like, what do you, what do I know and what is reality? And so to me, it's not surprising that you got up there and you're like, oh, this is real and I'm willing right. to say it, you know? And then people came up to you and you're like, that's how I feel. <laughs> and what an amazing um, moment to look back on, so. Yeah, I mean, it didn't hurt that I had gone and got this wacky master's degree at the University of Chicago. So people thought, okay, well, she's not, you know, a dummy because she couldn't have done that. That didn't hurt. But I also like, it, it, I look back now, I mean, speaking of my journey, this sounds wild, but I like, I like, feel like I was born to do this. Like my whole, everything in my life put me in this place that allowed me to do this. Denise, you've poetically mastered the intersection of psychology, money, and risk. 
Can you recall one of the most difficult scenarios you found yourself in professionally? You're going to hate what comes to my mind. A couple of times, like I've, been, I've spoken on a panel and, you know, or spoken in general, whatever. And some hedge fund managers says they're super interested in what I have to say. And, you know, can we meet for coffee or whatever? And then it turns out to not be about business. Like that's happened to me. There's two times I can think of and literally even as I say it, it makes my heart beat faster. You know, it's so annoying. Um, and then another, I was interviewing at a big famous hedge fund to replace the performance coach they had had in there. And someone who was very close to the previous coach was interviewing me. And he basically belittled me and, and said, you know, he was going to go run to the the CIO and tell him I said such and such, which was just like jaw dropping, <laughs> you know, like who does that? So it's those kind of, you know, moments where you think you're on equal footing and you think you're providing some value and, and the response you get is, a, you know, we'll just politely say a bit dismissive. How did you, how did you tackle those? Like, what, how did you, I guess I, I, they sound like such pivotal moments in your career where you had to go up to bat. Like, what was your, what was your tactic in responding to those men? The truth is I kind of just ignore it. I mean, earlier in my career, prior to um, all of this, when I was still in the computer business and not at IBM, I, was, I found out I was the only woman and the only IBMer that they had ever hired. And they, and they told me afterwards, they hired me as an experiment. <gasps> And then part of that experiment included, they said, let's go out to dinner with this client. Like, and we went out, to, we did socialize with a lot of clients. That was kind of the way they sold. And so we go to dinner with this client and then he wants to go to a strip club. And so I go, cause whatever. Um, and then he starts coming on to me in a really seriously aggressive way, like involving his hands. And then they ended up fessing up that the whole thing was a plot to see what I would do. I was just like, are you people? Because I just was like, get your hands off me, buddy. Like, what the hell? God. And then the guys that set it up felt bad and were embarrassed. And I, I was just like, I think partly I was raised. My father um, was the child of a, a single mother. My grandmother divorced her husband in 1932 with two young children because he was in the Navy and didn't send any money home. And so like, think about that in the middle of the depression with two young kids. Well, my dad was two. So he was raised by this really strong woman and he had no kind of sexist views. So I didn't have any idea that women could get treated differently in any way. So when it happened, stuff like, I, I was just like, what's your problem? Like, I didn't, you know, like, and I, I remember just like swatting that guy away. And it was like one in the morning or something, it was ridiculous. And then my guys were like, we're so sorry. Like, we, I was like, you're all idiots. <laughs> <laughs> what, Denise, it's so funny that you say that because I was talking to a CIO last night and she and I were talking about how the higher up you have to go in finance, the higher your threshold has to be for tolerating that BS, right? Because to an extent, you either to others end up being... Be part of the problem or you end up becoming essentially one of the boys, right? So then there ends up being this tipping point where you finally have to like start pushing back and like owning your power and saying, this is no longer acceptable. Right. And I feel like we're finally seeing the pendulum swing in that direction. But it, it was something that I personally experienced quite a bit uh, doing a lot of the things that I had to do where you just something horrible happens and you brush it off or you just right. tolerate it. And it just ends up stacking up until you reach that tipping point. So I, uh, it's way too common. It's way, way, way too common. Yeah. Um, yeah. It helped me that I didn't know about it or expect it. It also helped me that I, you know, like I remember even telling my father about it and he was just like, he, he told me I was overreacting. I'm like, oh my God. Um, but yeah, you just, yeah. It's, I, I, I mean, you know, I've been in the professional world quite a long time. 
probably longer than both of you have been alive. And I'm like, you know, I'm amazed that it's still as bad as it is, actually. And also, IBM was not, IBM was enor enormously egalitarian. Like, I worked for a woman in my training class. They hired the equal number of women and men. You know, like, it just... So, it was after I left IBM that I started to encounter any of that, really. Uh, which wow. was Yeah. Which was good and bad, but... Uh, Denise, you, you mentioned that it it hasn't changed a lot really but do you think there's like a a certain veil over it that people should be aware of that are in the industry that are women you know the reality is it's often so subtle right like like the, let's just take you know a, a lesser version and being taken to a strip club of mansplaining like when men just naturally think they have to explain how something works to them like that's so much e that's so much easier to see now but it's a very subtle, you know, very, very um, you can be really at risk of like saying you're overreacting or whatever. I think it, everyone just needs to be realistic. And cases where it's basically innocent, like a guy doing something doesn't mean anything that's disrespectful in any way. But just because he's a guy and he's been trained, like it comes across it. And there are other cases where it is disrespectful, whatever the it is, right? From mansplaining to strip clubs. And so you kind of have to decipher which is which. And I think pick your battles, you know, and also just basically be matter of fact, like, hey, you know. I mean, I even say to my husband sometimes, like, would this thing happen to a guy? I found that oftentimes guys are, they do say, yeah, probably not. If they're realistic, you know, and if they're willing to, to be analytical. I also think it's such a boys club in the finance world that a lot of other industries faced a lot of reconciliation and like uh, truly a reckoning of the Me Too movement and I don't think that it actually raged through the finance industry whatsoever like I still I still to this day think about one of the bank presidents that I worked with who I know from personal experience like sexually harassed a bunch of women and he got promoted uh during the me too movement rather than like his thick file of complaints ever getting reviewed so I, I just you know, I look back on those things and contemplate how much longer that kind of stuff is going to continue to get swept under the rug, particularly in our industry, because it's just considered to be acceptable. So I have another question for you, Denise. Can you can you give advice to our listeners as someone? So if somebody was preparing themselves to take on a big career risk, what what advice would you give them? Hmm. Ask themselves, what do I really think? I mean, what do I really think? How much do I believe it? And that leads to what am I feeling? What am I really feeling and why? And the answers to those four questions in, in two and three are sort of merged because beliefs and feelings are often merged, but can get you really centered in yourself. And once you get centered in yourself, it matters way less if people say no or say it can't be done or are discouraging. Sure, you know, you might feel discouraged for an afternoon or whatever, but then you rem remember, like, this is what I really think. This is what I really believe. You know, this is what I feel about it. This is why. Like, knowing those things allows you to act out of the power that you may or may not know you have in a way that you can't when you're kind of dancing around them, when you don't face those questions directly. I love that. Um, personally, like through this past year, I've started to take, and Cy has too, and we've talked about it a lot. And so it's so amazing to hear your perspective, Denise. Um, but, you know, we start to realize that the work that we do have now that we're in our homes, I mean, I'm in my bedroom for God's sakes, you know, like this is very personal to me. Um, sometimes, you know, we need to look at our situations and realize where are we being codependent and where are we being people pleasers, um, at least for me as a woman. 
And how do we start to break those ties to get back to who we are? And it is so, so difficult um, to be able to stand on your two feet and be like, wait, this is what I want and nervous about other people's reactions. Um, Can you recall like an instance in your career where you were facing that and overcame it to kind of move forward? I'm sure I have them. (laughs) Um, I think, you know, I was telling one client yesterday about another client. So a few years ago, I had this client who, you know, big time hedge fund guy, that if it became known that I was working with this person, I thought it would be really good for our, you know, bigger picture hedge fund consulting. So I realized a few months into it that every time I went to see this person, I was intimidated. Now, I know from my work that the best thing you can do is put your real feelings into words. So, which is the opposite of what most people think. So in the first few minutes of seeing this person every week in their office in New York City, I would, he'd be talking and I'd be saying to myself, I'm so Like, but what happens is when you allow yourself to, to, uh, to itemize, articulate, make your feelings explicit, the anxiety, first of all, you can keep the anxiety of a secret. And I can guarantee you, if you ask that guy, if I was ever intimidated by him, he would say, are you out of your mind? Like that woman like told me, you know, this said, no, she's not intimidated by me. Um, but it neutralizes. Like when you just admit how you really feel, it actually neutralizes the energy somewhat. And even if the energy is still there, you can keep it to yourself. So I've taught this like to professional athletes to just be able to say, oh God, I'm terrified, I'm gonna blow this. And like, they're amazed at their results. It's called emotion differentiation and emotion granularity and there's actual real research on it. I didn't just make it up. No, we'll take notes on it and we'll we'll probably have more questions for you as follow-up for sure. I know Megan I definitely will will have follow-up on that. I actually love love when people provide that kind of information to us. So kind of tying into that, Denise, can you explain the term neuroeconomics and and really how you've used it within your work and and made people successful by using it? Yeah, so a group of neuroscientists who were studying decision-making and particularly market decision-making came up with a term. And it really just does mean, how does the brain make a risk decision? You know, and they kind of, you know, they took the idea of like economics, right? Studying group behavior and group dynamics and how different group behavior, you know, influences other and what does that mean for economic activity? And just said, How is that reflected in the brain? So I was lucky enough to find the Society for Neuroeconomics fairly early on, right after that, like January 2005, when people start calling. Because what I did then was I just, I like, I went back to the research to add to what I was saying. And so like I went to a Society for Neuroeconomics meeting early on, which by the way, going to an academic meeting is so different than going to a business meeting. Um, <laughs> but in any event, um, and I got to hear, like there was all, the, like in 2005, there was a meta-analysis, meaning take all the papers and review all the results of all the papers by two guys at Caltech, which is not exactly a dumpy place. Um, and they said, it's not enough to know what should be done. One must also feel it. Mm. In 2005. Like, so I'm like, re- reverse engineer that everything you do has a feeling involved. So I got all sorts of backup data, like to prove my points about the role of feelings and emotions and risk decision making from these neuroeconomic guys and women. That I just resonates with me really deeply, especially of late, because uh, I, you know, we touched on it at the very beginning, but I'm definitely like I'm currently knee deep in trading JPEGs uh, as much as I hate to admit that. And and I know that it's entirely based on emotions. Right. <laughs> so right. <laughs> like that, that entire market as interesting and really cool as it is to own like a six pixel 
thing on my phone that has no use beyond the six pixel existence. Uh, it's been it's been an emotional journey for me this year. Well, so. a point that I often make um, when I give talks, and I've made as it relates to crypto, is look, basically any financial asset only has value because people believe that it does. Yeah. Period. Like, you know, there's some intrinsic value to this town home I'm in because provide shelter in, you know, more. But anything that's like, can be, that is electronic and based in numbers, it only has value because we think it does. So it doesn't matter, like, if it's six pixels or if it's, you know, the S&P it doesn't really matter. <laughs> It's a, it's a game of perceived value. And by the way, the way to play it, and the, and the neuroeconomists at Caltech have shown this, is to predict other people, to use more. And that's what really technical analysis is, right? It's a reflection of other people. What are other people going to believe about the value of this in the future is the fundamental question of trading. And it's something that I always get like locked into a loop of, Janice. So when I'm looking at stuff because there's also that bias that you are smarter than the rest of the market right so how like how do you even mitigate that because there's this side of me that's like well i used to do derivatives i have like an insider line into some of this stuff i know what i'm doing and then there's this other piece of me that's like don't fall for that fallacy where you think that you know what other people are doing because you're going to end up being one of those people that thinks you're a half step ahead when really you're actually knee deep in jpegs because everyone else is also desiring to be knee deep in JPEGs? Well, I'm always, I'm going to say that like the question, what am I feeling and why is always a competitive advantage, a question. So, you know, so like, okay, mm -hmm. you play that out. Mm -hmm. You're saying, okay, I kind of feel smarter than everybody. Hmm. Maybe that's mm -hmm. true. Maybe that's not true, but it sounds like I'm putting myself at risk. So just like literally being aware that you're being feeling, yeah, you to the right. Right? You'd be less likely in, in the five minutes following answer to that question to act on the fact that you feel like you're smarter. Which, by the way, you sort of said something you know, that's only tangentially connected, but I just want to say, like, people are forever trying to find the thing in the market that nobody else knows to prove how smart they are. That actually doesn't work. Mm -hmm. You need everybody to see what you see. You just need them to see it right after you do. If it's so obscure, it's so brilliant. <laughs> it does you no good because the rest of the people who are dumber than yeah. you, you know, I'm talking to the world out there, like aren't going to see it. And so therefore they're not going to buy the thing, you know, like it, it, you, don't, you, don't, you just want to be, you know, you said a half a step, a quarter step ahead of stuff everybody's going to see because that's what's going to drive. Yeah. And so totally agree with that. And that actually correlates to something that Megan and I have touched on in previous episodes, but is super important to me as like, from someone like you, especially that understands this stuff, is there actually a difference in risk taking between men and women? Yeah, it's not my expertise, but to the extent that I understand from other people who've done research, there is. And women tend overall to take less risk. Mm -hmm. But specifically, I think the way that plays out in practicality is women are way less subject to fear of missing out by virtue of keeping up with the other guy like would you would you say that women are anti-fomo i i never thought about the word ant but they're unfomo they they just don't get caught up in it as much. like i can't tell you i mean i have one former client in particular who was the absolute worst i mean he would articulate his very detailed long-term process and then he'd go out to drinks with his buddies at other hedge funds. And you're like, so-and-so is buying Alibaba. We got to buy more Alibaba. And his team would be like, <laughs> what? Like, and it was relentless. Like every time he'd go to a conference or out to drinks or whatever, all of a sudden they were buying somebody else's position. We, it, I mean, that was a very extreme case. But women just tend to like do their own work and make their own decisions and don't have that feeling that if someone else is in it, they need to be in it. 
I actually love hearing that because I was always the most risk averse uh, on my teams, but also typically the most like somewhere near the top in terms of success. So I, I like hearing that because I also think that being risk averse isn't necessarily a bad thing. It usually means that you have a steady stream of income and you're practical about how you make your decisions around that. And maybe even if you'd looked at it, there were times that you really believed in something that you took bigger risks. You might guess. like, uh, Yeah. I, you know, these JPEGs, I'm telling you, Janice, there's a future here. I haven't figured out what that future is. Maybe I end up doing some JPEGs myself or something, but I'm still, I'm messing around with it without, you know, using my fun money, if you yeah. will, uh, without actually gambling on it. So. We want to do one of our book cover. Actually, I have my intern working on it. Like, because I don't even know that much about it. I have a female client who started looking into it and is all over it. Female portfolio manager mm. um, in the consumer space. And she's like, this is a thing. And she's very analytical. But It's a thing. Yeah, yeah, For yeah. sure, it's a thing. I have a funny risk-taking story, though, just because you guys are. So I used to trade at a place called Show and Tell. Um, and at the time, which was a big day trading, it's still in existence. But at the time, I was sitting at, next to Dimitri Baliazmi, who now is Baliazmi Asset Management, this huge hedge fund. But in any event, um, we were day traders and we were supposed to do a lot of trades, but I never liked to trade the market open because I was like, nobody knows what's going on. Like, let's see how it opens and how it reacts and whatnot. So I would never trade first thing in the morning. And they came to me and said, we're going to put you on a performance plan. And now just, you know, rest assured, we're doing it because we think you have so much potential, but you have to do 10 trades in the first 10 minutes. I'm like, are you people out of your ever loving minds? <laughs> like, I have a clue what's going on. So I can, you know, buy Micron or Amazon or whatever it was at the time. I don't think Amazon existed, but um, maybe they did. But um, like, they're like, you won't take enough risk. In the afternoon, I would take massive amounts of risk. The day I had this idea that, you know, I had to take all this risk first thing in the morning, and it made no sense to me. So, it was next to impossible to do. And I think that's typical of women. Like if it doesn't really make sense to us, we're not going to do it. I, you know what? I was the same way. I never traded on days where there was a Fed announcement. So if they were releasing Fed notes or if that, you know what I mean? There were, because that would shake interest rates so massively that there would be huge disparities in the market. I, I was the same way. And I used to get reprimanded for not wanting to do that. Yeah. And I was like, well, especially that entire week is like a crazy week. Right. So I, I get that on a deep level. Uh, yeah. I, remember, I can like still see the paper, you know, must take 10 trades in the first 10 minutes. And me, and I, again, sort of like the guys coming on to me or the, you know, that even the, like, are you guys crazy? <laughs> <You're stupid. laughs> like, let me, let me live in my trading theory. You guys hired me for a reason. Yeah, like, like, gosh, wild. but it's just sticking. But there is actual yeah. research. There's a woman named Meredith Jones can't think of the name of her book, but it's about female portfolio managers and mm. asset managers. Versus male. And she's done a lot of research. And I'm fairly sure that Meredith would say that women don't get caught up in fear of missing out as much. So Denise, we want to be really mindful of your time because we know it's very precious. Um, and we are, for this season two, we're doing series-based approaches. And so in the series, you are how to Tackle Risk, which you've given us so many granular details on, and I love it so much. Um, but we're also asking all of our interviewees four questions kind of about the series. So the first one is kind of off topic, but I'm curious on your thoughts, is if a woman is having a baby, let's say she's in finance, um, and trying to tell their boss they're pregnant, what approach do you think that they should take? Get, get all their anxieties out on the table. Um, in, in like a what's the worst that can happen and work through their own feelings about what's the worst that can happen, you know, preferably with a supportive husband um, so that they're like, okay, well, if that happens, they're prepared for it. But oftentimes when we do that, we realize that whatever, the, whatever our prediction is, is unlikely to happen. I was going to say something quickly, which is a big thing to say quickly, but the brain, the human brain is always predicting what's going to happen based on one's past experience. So, and you don't realize you're doing it. You're like, you're predicting the next words coming out of my mouth right now. Like we just, that's what we do. So there's going to be fear and anxiety around that for obvious reasons. 
it just, it helps to know what that subconscious prediction is because then you can like kind of work through the possibilities in advance. And then when you do that, like you're just, again, more centered and more confident in what you do. It's the opposite kind of a positive thinking, by the way, like, cause you just have to dive into like, this could go wrong this way or this, you know. But if you do it in the hypothetical, you're much better at handling it in, you know, the real world. So Denise, I think what I'm hearing you say is to contemplate what the reality looks like and plan for it and then really just lay it all on the table so that everybody can see exactly what you're thinking and the path that you think that they're going down. And I guess tied to the next two questions that are correlated to that, how would you suggest someone negotiate a pay raise or, you know, negotiating their initial salary at their job? You know, I had a, I had a client once say, Price is only an issue in the absence of value. So it's always about being clear about your value. You know, I was negotiating with a client just yesterday over switching to a bonus, um, you know, a lower fee and a bonus. I was actually negotiating with their COO. It was like, why isn't it like a lawyer is paying you? Or, or, you know, well, it depends on what value you get out of that answer. So again, if we are clear and solid, like we believe ourselves as to the value we are providing or will be providing, we can articulate that in a more persuasive way. So that applies to initial salary, it applies to pay raises, um, but like we have to, it's more effective if we work through our anxieties about it and get what are we doing? Why? So that we're clear, like back to even my IBM, like what do I think is the truth? You know, they don't want to hire me because I didn't go to Harvard or whatever, but I know I can do the job. Like you got to work through it on your own. What people tend to do is sort of hope for the best and ask the question in a semi-nervous way, which transmits the feeling like that it's okay to say no. If you work through all that on your own and you can still be super nervous, but you can do that keeping it a secret thing. Like you transmit the feeling that you deserve whatever you're asking for because you believe you do. But you got to sort through like what you really believe in order to present in that way. So, and that, that actually it goes full circle then, because it sounds like it's working through your mind on exactly what you think the reality is and being able to present everything as a case to someone. And I think that the proof is kind of in what your you believe your value is, because the only times I've ever really succeeded at either asking for a pay raise or getting a promotion or getting the job that I wanted was when I was able to present my value. So I, ugh, that one sent like a small chill down my back and and hopefully that resonated with a lot of our listeners. Denise, I am so appreciative of your time. Thank you so much for, for this, this interview. I, I think both Megan and I have taken away so much from it. I have one question left for you. Where can people find you online? Where can they reach out to you? How, how do we get in contact? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me, by the way. Uh, the company is The Rethink Group, and it's therethinkgroup.net. You can sign up for our newsletter. Um, I'm on Twitter and Instagram and even now TikTok as Denise <laughs> Kaschel. Um, we're not so great about sending newsletters out often, but we do get them out now and then and again. Um, and there's a ton of information on our website. I mean, just a ton, like interviews with me back 15 years. You know, so um, all kinds of info there. Amazing, Denise. This has been a wealth of knowledge for us. Um, you should see my notebook next to me full of tons of notes. <laughs> this is definitely going to be one of those episodes. I tell Sai this all the time that I listen back to 
um, as a listener and try to take things and nuggets away. So thank you for spending the time with us. This is super invaluable. It's amazing. Oh, thanks so much for having me. I'm glad you're finding it helpful. Yes, totally. Wonderful. I feel extremely invigorated, Meg. I don't know how you feel after that interview, but like I'm, I feel like I am hyped up. <laughs> you know, today was one of the days where I was like, God, we're recording really early. I think I need a lot of coffee. I almost don't need any more coffee because I'm so <laughs> amped as well. I mean, my God, like really, I was intim- I was intimidated and I had some self-talk before this to talk to Denise Shaw. I'm not going to lie to you. Um, but the advice she gave was, it's okay to be intimidated and talk about your anxiety and put it in the forefront. And she really broke down her very like complex, complicated research based approach into something so applicable for the everyday female outside of finance even. And I just want to kind of applaud her for that. Um, And again, I'm not surprised, but I'm also like, should we go to Sun Valley and hang out with her? (laughs) <laughs> is how I feel. I, I think we both agree that we both need to go have a martini with Denise in the very near future because she's so cool. I, yeah, I loved feeling a little bit more validated about all of my emotional decisions surrounding JPEGs recently. I also, I love that she was able to put words to my anxiety when I am nervous about doing something like asking for a promotion or, you know, shifting jobs, like what exactly all of that means Mm -hmm. and, and how it's going to, how it's, how I can start wearing my anxiety on my sleeve rather than having to just like, I don't know, fake it. I, I hate, I hate when people say fake it. I would much rather like talk about it, put it on the table and then, mitigate it and have that plan well in advance like planning it sounds like is the solution and you know I'm starting to do that more and more but it's definitely something that's a newer concept to me when it comes to my emotions not like right like you and I both know that we are we are both big time planners like those vacations are always well well planned out but when it comes to my emotions planning my emotions is not something I had ever thought about Yeah, the next post-it that's going next to the ones of, you know, our to-do and my to-do at work is what do you know and what is reality? And I kept hearing her say that to herself and it really kind of resonates with me. Like, put that on a freaking t-shirt, Denise. Like, let's cross-promote the crap out of it because that's, that's gold right there is it's all about you at the end of the day and you feeling your way out through a situation. And when your gut is telling you, nah, this ain't right, it's probably time to go. That's what I heard. So, oh. yeah. So many good nuggets. I'm excited to listen back to this episode. I, mm-hmm. sh- I mean, should we end on a high note? Should we wrap it up? Yeah, girl. Yeah. I love you. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> I love you. Bye. Right. Bye.